This webinar is the Wood Diaphragm Design DES 432, and my name is Michelle Cambiron, Senior Director of Education for the American Wood Council. And the presentation is copyrighted by American Wood Council. If you'd like to use any portion of the webinar or the presentation, please contact us and we can help expedite that. And then we have the AIA slide that we're required to include that states that we are registered with AIA to provide continuing education and this presentation will provide you with uh, continuing education credit provided you stay within the webinar for the allotted time that Lori mentioned. Also, Lori went over the disclaimer. I won't go into detail since she went over it already. And then we have the course description that all of you read probably to register for the presentation. And then we have the learning objectives. Uh, this presentation is about wood diaphragm deflection. Uh, we're gonna really dive deep into this topic and it's the whole one and a half hours will probably be all on the diaphragm deflection. But hopefully you'll gain some really good information from it to know the background behind the equation, um, what the basis is for the equations and other aspects about it. And we'll look at three-term and four-term deflection equation. They are different, but they are equivalent as well. Um, I'll explain that later. And we'll look at each of the components of the deflection equation and also get into a deflection example. So right off the bat, we're going to do a poll. And throughout the presentation, we'll do polls to engage the audience if you haven't participated in our webinars before. And those polls do not count towards your continuing education. So Lori? All right, this first one's the easiest one because there's no wrong answers. This one is just, what is your profession? So architect, engineer, code official, fire service, or builder, manufacturer, other. And if you are other, we would ask that you could would share with us in the questions or chat box uh, what, what your profession is, if it doesn't fall into any of those that we've included. And as always, we'll last. We'll keep the poll open about 30 seconds, or until about 75 to 80 percent of you have voted, and we have both of those. So I'm going to go ahead and close. And we have a very engineer-heavy crowd, as this topic uh, would probably draw that that type. And again, for those of you that did have difficulty with the poll, if you were not able to answer, please remember uh, we we. Uh, mentioned that if you're in full screen and you're not able to vote in the poll, going to a, a smaller screen does allow the the polling to work. We're not sure why it works. We've made go to aware, but uh, so um, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you, Michelle. As you can see, we've got about 75% engineers here. Great, and that's probably expected given this topic. So great, glad to have you join us and glad all of you to join us. Um, so we have one more poll coming up and this is kind of a fun poll, just to find out what the experience is in the audience with related to wood construction or plan review of structural wood construction. As you can tell, there's more than a few uh, comic book movie fans on the education team. So this one is, if I were to categorize my experience with design or plan review of structural wood construction, I would be Groot, Rocket Raccoon, Black Widow, Captain America, or Iron Man. Someone mentioned Star-Lord in the previous presentation. We should include Star-Lord. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep that in mind for future. All right, we're at about 30 seconds and about 75% have voted. So we'll go ahead and close and share. And it looks like we've got a, a pretty broad spread of folks. Not too many people are uh, 
are novices, but not too many people are experts either. So hopefully everybody will be able to take away something useful from today's presentation. So maybe what we could do is draw on that expert and have them present this webinar. <laughs> Yeah, you and I can <laughs> I'd be happy to hand it back. over. I'm kidding, of <laughs> course. <laughs> okay, so we're well, glad to have you with us, and um, nice uh, for all of you to play along with this little poll. It gives us an idea about uh, your experience in wood construction. I know when I present or provide education throughout the nation, um, th there is not well, there is rarely a dumb question from people about wood construction. Even those that are experts don't know everything about wood construction. So um, anyway, glad to have you join us and we'll proceed on through the presentation. So to give you an overview of how we're gonna progress through the presentation, first we're gonna look at some very basic information about diaphragms, and just to give a baseline for this presentation and we'll look how it's uh, adopted the code acceptance of the wind and seismic provisions. Then we'll get into the actual diaphragm deflection equation. And we'll look at the four term equation versus the three term equation and see how they interrelate and what the, each part of the equation means. And then we'll also get into a diaphragm deflection example and really dive deep into it also and look at the elements and how to determine the deflection for the diaphragms. And then there are some, in your handout, you probably, if you, ha you um, downloaded it, there are some FAQs. Those are based on FAQs that we actually get in the uh, info desk that Lori covers. And um, so, if we have time, we'll get into those, but those were mainly provided just for additional information beyond what is presented in the presentation. And we'll also get into some questions that are being sent in through the question chat box. Okay, so first, right off the bat, we'll get into the basic lateral load overview and code acceptance of the 2015 wind and seismic provisions. So this presentation is going to be based on the 2015 wind and seismic provisions or special design provisions for wind and seismic. I'll call it wind and seismic provisions. Some people call it SPIDWIS. I'm not sure how they get SPIDWIS, but it is a nickname throughout the industry. And the first adoption of the 2015 wind and seismic provisions was in the 2015 IBC. I know some of the areas of the country are on the 2012 IBC or even sooner than, uh, earlier than that. Those would be based on the 2008 wind and seismic provision. But there is quite a bit of clarification and changes that occurred from the 2008 to the 2015. As you can imagine, seven years, there would be some more incorporation about what is going on in the industry, how we're designing or the architects are designing the look of the building and how we are able to analyze those buildings, specifically related to open front structures. So both the 2015 and the 2018 IBC reference the 2015 wind and seismic provisions, and it's mandatory to use this for the design, lateral design of wood structures. Now, what is interesting is that for the 2015 IBC, it references the 2015 wind and seismic provisions, which also references ASCE 710. This is where we get our minimum design loads for buildings and other structures. However, when the 2018 IBC was published or went through all the code changes, this referenced still the 2015 wind and seismic provision, but it references the, 2000, uh, the ASCE 716. So a little bit of difference. When we're talking about diaphragms, there's literally no change related to between the 2016 to the, from the 2010 to the 2016. And I'll, I'll go over some minor changes, but it, it doesn't really impact it very well. I mean, very much. 
as far as the design of wood diaphragms. Okay, so here's some basic overall look at a diaphragm and how the loads are transferred to the diaphragm. We have wind design and then we have seismic design. So if we're looking at wind, the wind applies pressure to our walls and the walls have studs that span from the foundation to the top plates the and the diaphragm. So those top plates and that those walls transfer the load to the diaphragm, the diaphragm deflects, and it also transfers the load to the shear walls. And then if we're dealing with seismic loads, we idealize it as if a mass, the mass of the building is concentrated at the roof diaphragm, the earth moves back and forth and the structure wants to catch up. And so that load is resisted by the diaphragm and then acts like a beam and transfers that load to the shear walls. If we were to look at a plan view of the diaphragm, it would look like this. And it's similar to a beam in that we have a resistance here by the shear walls and resistance here. And it's idealized as a simply supported structure. Or, or a beam. Now a beam, when we look at a beam, just a regular beam, not a diaphragm, but a beam, there are two deflection components that contribute to the deflection of a beam. One is bending and one is shear. However, typically the shear deflection is ne negligible and we only look at the bending deflection when, it's, when we're doing the calculations. Now that's where it's different when we look at a diaphragm. A diaphragm, the total deflection is the sum of the deflection caused by a number of factors in addition to the bending and shear. And the other factors can contribute significantly amount to the total deflection. And we'll look at that later on in the presentation. But when we apply a load to that diaphragm, we have our boundary members here we have our shear walls here and here, and then we have our nail sheathing here. And when that load is applied, we assume a simply supported beam and it deflects and our top cords, uh, our top plates, and, and if you're looking at a floor, sill plates, top plates, um, they can make up our cords that resist that bending. And then it, we, it transfers the load to the shear walls at each end. And the way we transfer the load, we assume simply supported. We take half the tributary area to this wall and half the tributary area to this wall, uh, assuming a flexible diaphragm. Now, also, if we were to look at the actual panels, say this is a diaphragm here. We have shear walls here, shear walls here we have this uniform load applied down on the sheet. And then these are the actual panels, usually eight, four by eight, and they can be staggered. This would be like a load case one in the diaphragm tables. You would see that um, if you were to look at this, that when the load applies, the sheathing with, it shows sheathing with nail deformation. And so as the panels rotate, it, it rotates as the diaphragm is loaded. So if you were to watch a diaphragm test, you would see the loading going down here applied. And then um, you would see the panels rotate as if they were floating over the uh, framing members. Um, then the diaphragm deforms and it looks like the, the panels are floating on top of the framing and the rotating and then the nails are yielding. So here's an example where we have this uniform loan. You'd see the panels rotating and then the resistance here by the nails and they aren't all uniformly resisting that uh, the lo applied load. So as they get greater and greater, you see more deformation and then the load is obviously higher here to the shear walls than it is here. And the wood diaphragm information that knowing all of this is from testing that has been performed previously. 
and the wood diaphragm information that we have in the standard is largely based on observation and testing done probably about 40 years ago on diaphragms ranging from 24 by 24 to 20 by 60. But this one just happens to be one that's 40 by 20. So all of this movement and deformation of the panels, of the uh, nails yielding, is what really contribute to the overall deflection of a diaphragm, which is unlike what you would see in a beam. Okay, so in addition to the cords, the shear walls, and the wood structural panels, if you're designing a diaphragm that's in seismic design category C, D, E, and F, and you're resisting lateral loads, that would be out of plane loads of concrete or masonry structural walls, there needs to be some continuous ties and struts continually across the whole diaphragm from cord to cord and anchoring that, those walls into the diaphragm. This is a requirement by ASCE 710 and 716. And it's also included, this is something new to the 2015 wind and seismic provisions that's been included in the standard, um, which wasn't in the 2008. It was, I believe, in the IBC though. Okay, now we're going to look a little deeper at the deflection equations. And if we were to go to chapter 23, and specifically section 2305.2, diaphragm deflection, you can see that it referenced AWC wind and seismic provisions for determining the deflection. So that's one path. Now, if we have a wood structural panel that has staples, and the fasteners are uniformly uh, distributed throughout the diaphragm, we're allowed to use this equation. And again, this is just for staples, and also it's for blocked wood structural panels, and the distribution of the fasteners is uniform. And also what it states is for non-uniform fastened, the constant in, the, in this third term of the equation shall be modified by approved method. So this is something that we would um, look at, uh, well, we'll look at in the Q&A because I have something that addresses this. But anything other than wood structural panel blocked uh, and staples would need to be analyzed by some other method. So that's where the wind and seismic provision comes in. In the wind and seismic provision in chapter four, we have a three term equation. And here we go, we have uh, the first term here, and this is the bending cord, and this is the bending cord slip. And then we have also the middle term where it takes into, takes into account shear deformation. So this equation, can be used for flat and folded roof diaphragms. It can be used for floors, et cetera. And it also extends the use of determining the deflection to other materials like lumber or, and also extends it to unblocked diaphragm. So this is a simp uh, simplification of the four term equation, algebraic simplification. And we'll look at how this was determined, the, the middle term. So for the four term, it, the two, this equation, oops, sorry about that. This equation and this equation is the same for the four term. It's the middle equation that's uh, different or, or the calculation. So we still have the four term equation in the commentary of the wind and seismic provision for those who still would like to use it. And as I mentioned previously, this is the bending cord deformation excluding slip and the bending cord slip splice split. And then the middle takes care of the deformation, shear deformation. Also included in the commentary is the three term equation. It's not different. It's just included there just to have the two equations available together. And to look at it a little bit closer, we would see that uh, V, that's the induced shear, and that is in pound feet. Then we have L, 
that's the length, and that is in feet. And then we have the modulus of elasticity of the diaphragm cord, which is in pounds per square inch. And then we have the area, again, that's of the cord, and that's in square inches. And then W is the width, actually the depth of the diaphragm. And uh, then we have the apparent shear stiffness, uh, and then uh, the W, and then this has to take in, takes into the distance to the cord splice and then the displacement at the cord splice. So one thing to remember is that this 5 eighths, that 5 eighths uh, is constant and incorporates background derivations that cancel out the units of feet in the first term. So in other words, there is no need to convert feet to inches because that's already taken into consideration with the 5 eighths. So when in plugging into this equation, um, look at the nomenclature and make sure that your units match up. In other words, don't change the L to inches when inputting into this equation. Okay. Okay, so the in the four-term equation, we have those two middle uh, equations, and then that is, and in the three-term, we do an algebraic simplification and make a one term here. So it simplifies the amount of calculations one needs to do, and then also encompasses lumbar diaphragms as well as unblocked diaphragms. And the other thing, hold on a second. Um, the distribution of shear forces among shear panels in a diaphragm is a function of the layup the nailing pattern of panels to the framing. And for this reason, because it's all of that, uh, the shear deflection in a diaphragm is related to panel shear, panel layup, nailing pattern, and nail load slip relationship. In the three-term equation, the panel shear and the nail slip are soon to be interrelated and have been combined into this single term. And I actually did a hand calculation just to prove to myself that this really equates to this. And um, just to, and it actually does. Not that I didn't disbelieve anybody, but <laughs> just to, sometimes you just gotta work through it to yourself just to understand what's going on. And that's kind of what we're trying to do here also. So you do the mathematical equation, set those two equations to equal each other, and then solve for G, and you will come up with this equation. And note that, uh, so we have an apparent shear stiffness, and that apparent shear stiffness is based on 1.4 times the allowable stress unit shear capacity. And that is because the capacities are need to be based on, uh, instead of the induced unit shear, it's based on a strength level force. And that is because also the, that's in ASCE 7, it requires that seismic story drift be determined using strength level design load. So another reason why the 1.4. Now, if we were to plot the two equations, we would see here on the horizontal axis, inches, that's, and then the vertical axis, axis, that's the load. So when a load is applied, it's gonna displace a little bit, another load, it's gonna displace a limit. So what here is plotted is that we have a linear term equation in the three term equation, which is a lot easier to deal with. And then we have a nonlinear term with that four term equation. However, at 1.4 ASD, the two equations are identical. And also, if you were to look at the differences between the nonlinear versus the linear, the maximum distance is about 0.045 inches, and that's about less than a sixteenth of an inch. So someone could say it's extremely conservative to use the three-term equation, but really, when you think about it, if it's only, it's less than a sixteenth of an inch, it's really not that conservative. Um, it really depends on the capacity, diaphragm capacity versus the load, and um, 
except other tall, you know, when you look at construction tolerances as well. So it's not that big of a difference. Okay, so if one would want to consider the um, using the four term equation, let me go here, then here are the tables that you would use. So for the first part, when we're looking at, and let me go back to that four term equation. This is the four term equations that we're gonna look at and where we would get the information to do that four term equation. So here we have table C 4.2.2a, the shear stiffness, which is G sub V, T sub V. This covers wood structural panels and we have two different grades. We have structural one grade and structural sheathing. We also have plywood and OSB for the different grades as well as three ply to five ply and then based on the span rating and the nominal uh, minimum nominal panel thickness. And then we also have it for lumber, which is shown here, uh, the shear stiffness for lumber. Now note that this says other sheathing materials. Well, this table is used for both deflection for shear walls and diaphragms, but the diaphragms in the wind and seismic provisions only cover wood structural panels with the two different grades and lumber. It does not include plywood side, well, that's obvious, particle boards or structural fiber boards. That is applicable for shear walls. So again, wood structural panel and lumber are the diaphragms that are covered in the wind and seismic provisions. And then in addition to that, we'll need to determine the fastener slip, which is in this table, again, wood structural panel sheathing, we have an equation for fastener slip, depending on the moisture content of the framing and as it, when it's fabricated. And um, in this example that we're gonna do later on, we're gonna assume a less than or equal to 19% moisture content. It also provides information on the fastener loads, V sub N, but we'll solve that based on the NDS. And then in addition to that, when doing the four term equation, we'll need to calculate E sub N using, well, the V sub N. So V sub N will be the load applied to the actual fastener. And sometimes in diaphragms, we will have different fasteners at different spacings. We'll have the edge nailing and then we'll have the boundary nailing. When we're looking at util, uh, determining the fastener slip, we're gonna use the edge panel edge nailing and not the boundary nailing. Because remember we were looking at the plan and seeing how the panels kind of float across the framing. What we're looking at is the slip in the diaphragm and not at the boundary nailing. And that's why we use the panel edge nailing and not the boundary nailing. We'll do an example of this later on. Okay, table 4.2, this is, now we're gonna get into the three term equation and where do we get our information? So for the three term equation, we have blocked wood structural panel diaphragms where we would go to get our nominal shear capacities. We will also get our apparent shear stiffness. And then we also have high load diaphragms. So that's another type of diaphragm that is covered, but this is, both of these are wood structural panel diaphragms. And then we have unblocked diaphragms, again, wood structural panel diaphragms. But this allows us to check the deflection or analyze the deflection for unblocked diaphragms because we have the apparent shear stiffnesses shown here to plug into that equation. And then in addition to that, we have the lumber diaphragm. So wood structural panels and lumber diaphragms are the what's included in the wind and seismic provisions. Now we'll look a little bit, well, a lot of it. <laughs> Is that a word? Anyway, um, for the apparent shear stiffness, some may question, okay, how do we get from the four term to the three term? And what we're gonna do is, actually come up with G sub A, 
by looking at those two terms in the four term equation, the two middle terms, and see if we actually, in fact, meet the G sub A that, that is in the tables. So we're going to derive G sub A. Our problem statement is derive G sub A in the wind and seismic provision table 4.2A for a blocked wood structural panel diaphragm constructed as follows. We have the sheathing grade of struck one OSB. Uh, so wood structural panel that's OSB and struck one. And then case number one, that's the sheathing layup. That's where it's very similar to what I showed with the staggered panel layup and the load applied at the top of the page going down. Then our nail size is six penny common. Uh, the diameter of the nail is 0.113 diameters and the length of the nail is two inches. Now also our panel thickness, our minimum nominal panel thickness is 5 16th inch. And then we have our boundary, na boundary nails and panel edge nailing at six, so six and six. If we had like six and four, we would use four to determining that nail deformation, but they happen to be the same. Minimum width of the nail face is two by nominal, so we have two by framing. And then we get our nominal unit shear capacity of 370 from the wind and seismic provision tables. And then we change it or make change it to, into an allowable stress design by dividing by two because the nominal shear capacities are that table is for both LRFD and ASD. And then this is the process that we will go through to determine what G sub A is. Now there was an error in the handout. So just note this in your handout. There was an, a typo here that had an extra zero. Just know that I'm sure you would have figured this out when you went through and did this, went through step by step, but just note that there's an extra zero. So you can X that out. Okay, so we'll determine first the panel shear stiffness, and then we'll look at the nail load slip, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll go through this step by step. This is the equation that we'll, we will use to determine our G sub A. So we go to our table 4.2 A, the nominal unit shear capacity. Remember we have struck one wood structural panel, 16, pe I mean six penny common nails, and we have our nominal uh, panel thickness of 5 16th, and then our framing is two bys. And so we go across and get 370 pounds per linear foot, and this is seismic. I forgot to say seismic is what we're now analyzing, but it's seismic. And then we also have the six and six. So we have 370 pounds per linear foot and to determine our unit shear capacity for seismic. Then we want to calculate our panel shear stiffness, G sub V, T sub V. And what we see is we go to our table in our commentary, C4.2.2a, to determine our shear stiffness, just pulling it from the table. Now note we're here at three eighths. We had five sixteenth inch thick panel. Well, there's a footnote too here that states GVTV values for three eighths inch panel with span rating of 24 over zero used to estimate GA values for five sixteenths inch panel. So we can use this for the five sixteenths inch panel. Then we had struck one in OSB and our panel shear stiffness is 77,500 pound inch for that depth. Then we want to determine our fastener slip. So first we determine our fastener load, V sub N. And we're going to do it at strength level four. So that's where the 1.4 comes in and we're using our edge nailing, and just to emphasize it even more, it's based on edge nailing. We do 1.4 times our allowable stress design, which was 185, or was it 189? 
185, I believe it was. Plug that into the equation and we get 129.5 pound per uh, nail. And one other thing is we're assuming that our moisture content of our framing is less than or equal to 19% moisture content. And then what do we do with that V sub N? We plug it into the equation here to determine what our fastener slip is. And this table is in the commentary as well in C4.2.2D. We have wood structural panel. Our fasteners are eight penny common. And then our fastener slip equation, again, we're using dry lumber or assuming that. And then our equation is here, V sub N divided by 456 to the 3.144 power. So we plug that all into the equation and get everything. We determined this, we found this, and we found this. And that equals 14,660. And again, here's that typo again. There was an extra zero in your notes, so X that out. And that is pretty darn close to 15 kip inches. And we went through all of that when we could have got it right here and pulled it from the table, the uh, 15 kip inches right there. So you can see the shortcut that it's provided us and they are equivalent to each other. And one other thing to think about is when we, uh, this table shows you some data from some testing that was done some years ago, but I couldn't tell you exactly when. I'm sure we could find out if you're really interested, but it um, shows you from the calculations and compares it to actual deflection that were measured when uh, these, these uh, diaphragms were tested. Um, so they tested for blocked and unblocked diaphragms, four of them, and compared it to what they had in the uh, for the calculations. Um, what they used is sheathed with 3 8 inch panels and uh, eight penny common nails and the diaphragm of a 24 by 24 and compared it and they come pretty close, pretty close to when you consider everything involved for the blocked, unblocked, all different uh, sizes, uh, well, the 24 by 24, and then you can see they're pretty close to what were calculated in the whole scheme of things. And this is up for 1.4 ASD. Okay, Lori, do you want to come in and um, do this poll? Sure thing. All right, so. SpidWiz includes which of the following sheathing materials for diaphragms? And sorry, slight typo there. That should be diaphragms. We forgot the I. But and again, remember this is just diaphragms we're talking about, guys. Is it wood structural panels, lumber, gypsum board, all of the above, or answers A and B only? Oh, we're we're not talking about diaphragms. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've Them got. <laughs> all right, we've got about about two thirds have voted. So I will close things out so we can keep rolling here and share the results. And Michelle, I really hope that it is uh, answers A and B because we've had Woo! seventy seven percent of people that said that, thirteen percent said all of the above, and then a few percent were spread across the other three. So why don't you let us know what the actual answer is? Okay, and this might be a record. Wow, so the answer is A and B. And uh, in previous slides, we talked about some information related to shear wall tables that included gypsum. 
But when we're talking about diaphragms, the wind and seismic provision includes wood structural panel and lumber diaphragms. Okay, now we're going to look at a step-by-step -step example for uh, covering wood diaphragm deflection. And we'll really look at each part of the equation and determining where you go to to get the information to plug into the equation and some background information on the uh, actual analysis. And here's our problem statement. We have a 48 foot long by 24 foot deep diaphragms. We're going to assume our chords are at third points here and here. So that's 16, and then this is actually 16 as well. And then our load that's applied to this diaphragm is 255 pounds per linear foot. Now we're gonna use the load for the, that's the capacity of the diaphragm. When analyzing a diaphragm, you will probably more likely use the induced load. That's what the equation calls for is the induced load and not the capacity, but, just for simplification, we're going to use the capacity of the diaphragm just to see what the maximum deflection you would be, be based on the capacity of the diaphragm or the, the shear capacity. So we'll do a case one, fully blocked diaphragm, 7 16 inch OSB sheathing, and eight penny common nails at six inches on center at all panel edges. And then also, let's see, did we say the grade? I think we'll look at it further down what the grade of the diaphragm is. Oh, sheathing, okay. And then, so calculate mid-span deflection for the blocked wood structural panel diaphragm. And the diaphragm cord splice is sized using the allowable stress design. So when we design that cord, we're gonna look at allowable stress design and determine the amount of fasteners we need based on all allowable stress design. However, when we get into the diaphragm and look at the deflection, we're gonna use those strength level forces. And then the diaphragm apparent shear stiffness is G sub A that we pull from the table. We don't have to go through all those acrobats to determine what G C that the middle term, it really simplifies our calculations. And then the allowable unit shear capacity comes from the table and we'll get into this in a little bit. And then the diaphragm cords, we're gonna assume a two, two by six, number two Douglas for large, which has a modulus of elasticity of 1.6 to the six power, pounds per square inch, and then the specific gravity of 0.50. Now normally, well not normally, but in a lot of cases you'll have a two by four top cords because you'll have a two by four wall, but in this case we're gonna assume two by six. Perhaps the they needed more room to put some plumbing or whatever in the other walls, hopefully not the shear walls, but <laughs> anyway, two by six is what we're dealing with. Okay. And uh, so we want to find out what our nominal shear capacity is. We go to our trusty table 4.2a, which provides us with uh, a seismic section and then a wind section. We have seismic here and then our sheathing grade. And then we have, okay, um, eight penny, 7 sixteenths, two by, and then we come up with 510 pounds per linear foot, which is shown here. And a 14 is our apparent shear stiffness, 14 kips, kip inch, kips per inch. And then to get it into an allowable stress design, we divide by two. That is important. Okay, so the first part of this design example, we're going to look at designing our cords because we need to know what that is so we can determine what our cord slip is going to be in the bending part of the equation. And we assumed, as you recall, we were going to assume that a cord splice is here and a cord splice is there at third points. And 
we need to understand what our shear is as well as our bending. So it's just taking those beam equations and saying W L divided by two for our shear and then W L squared over eight for our moment. And that would be the maximum moment here at mid span is the W L squared over eight. At the third points at 16 feet, we would use this equation. That's your basic beam equation to get that moment right at that location. And then we're gonna design the chords. And what we would see is that, uh, I mentioned that we have two two by sixes, Douglas fir number one, and we're gonna find out what, how many fasteners, what connectors are we gonna use to transfer that load to have that continuous load path across that double top plate splice. And uh, we're gonna assume that each for the top cord, one top cord or one top plate is designed to resist the induced axial force, whatever tension and compression. And then the second top plate is designed as a splice plate. Um, so the top will be the design to resist that axial load and then the bottom is just designed just to take that uh, splice plate and transfer that load across. And we're gonna assume 16 penny nails. So we go to our NDS tables and find out that the 16 penny nail is worth 114, I mean 141 pounds. We multiply times 1.6 because that's the load duration factor. And then we come up with 226 pounds. That's a capacity for one fastener in allowable stress design. So what's the axial load that we're gonna be resisting across that splice? Well, to get that axial load, it's just the moment divided by the depth of the diaphragm. And um, as we, at that area, um, at the third point, it's 65,280 foot pounds. We divide by 24 and we get an axial load of 2,720 pounds. And then we wanna determine how many fasteners do we need? So it's just the axial load then divided by the capacity of the fasteners and we have 12 nails. So then we're good to go. However, what happens if there's a splice right at that mid span where we have our maximum moment, maximum tension or compression? So let's look at that. And what we would see is that taking that maximum moment, dividing by 24 to get the tension and compression and the capacity of 226, we get 14 nails. So, we have 14 nails versus 12 nails. That's not a whole lot of difference in the whole scheme of things. So you may wanna just go ahead and calculate your fastener, number of fasteners by the maximum moment. I mean, really, when you think of it, where are the splices going to occur? They could occur right at that maximum moment. Now we'll continue on through though this uh, example by assuming that we have 12 fasteners because that's where we're going to take into account any displacement that we're going to see at that splice. So we look at the three term equation and now we're going to actually calculate the actual mid span deflection. We designed our cord, we're good to go, we know how many fasteners we have. And we'll look at each of the three terms. So the first term, this is the deflection due to bending and cord deformation. And this excludes any cord splice slip. So to determine the deflection, we have this equation, five times V induced V, but we're, for this example, we're using the actual capacity of the diaphragm. L is the length of the diaphragm and then eight, and remember, we need to be careful about the units that we don't change it into inches because we've already taken into account with this five eighths to not convert anything to different units. Um, so we have the pounds per linear foot, we have the feet for the length, E is the modulus of elasticity of the top plate, and then A is the area of the top plate, and then W is the depth. And um, so we come up with, 
And um, one thing, again, want to reiterate is that 1.4 times 255 pounds per linear foot, that's taken into strength level seismic load. And then we have the modulus of elasticity. And um, so what we're going to do is look at the single top plate to resist this load. And then we also are looking at a single, the area of a single top plate. So we're assuming for each chord, one top plate is designed to resist that induced axial load, tension or compression, while the second top plate is designed as a splice plate. Now this is just an engineering judgment that we're kind of, we may be conservative and uh, you could consider doubling the cross-sectional area, but if you did, that, again, that's up to your own engineering judgment, but we did a calculations to see what the difference in deflection or the change in deflection would be, and it's 0 0.04 inches, not a whole lot, but it, it's um, to consider both top plates. Okay, then the middle term of the equation, the deflection due to shear, panel shear, and nail slip. We have this equation, and we get our apparent shear stiffness from the table, and we need to determine, um, uh, then we are able to plug it into the equation while we get the, uh, the rest of it for the three-part equation. And then the last term of the equation, so that was pretty easy. That was plugging into this equation, getting the G sub A from the table. And then the last term, the third term, is where we look at the slip at the splice, where the nails will slip and the cord will slip, given that there could be some gaps when we have those uh, top plates butting up against each other. So we have this summation of x is the distance to the splice and then delta is that cord displacement i mean the splice displacement 2 w that's the w is the depth of the diaphragm and so this is the basic equation again we're trying to find out what that joint deformation is due to the cord slip this is the equation that we would use it's two times the T or C and then over gamma. So we have the joint dis deformation due to that cord slip and then the T and C are the tension compression of the cords. The gamma is the load slip modulus for the fasteners when they're gonna move, if they are gonna move, and then the number of actual fasteners, which is N. Then we find out that we need to determine what is our T and C. Now, if you recall, when we were designing our cord, we used an allowable stress design. But when we're looking at deflection, we need to look at the strength design. So that's why you see a 1.4 here. And we multiply that times 65,000, that's the moment, 65,280 foot pounds foot and then um, that's the mac the moment at the cord splice not the maximum moment because remember we're looking at the displacement at the cord slice and then 24 feet that's the depth to get the tension and compression so we're at 3808 which is 1.4 greater than what we used for our cord splice which was an allowable stress design and then we want to determine what actually is the um, deflect the gamma, which is our load slip modulus for the fasteners. And what we do is we go to our NDS, and this was an error also in the uh, previous presentation, which was when we included cross laminated timber in the NDS we added it as a chapter 10. So that bumped the original chapter 10 to chapter 11. So this, instead of being 10.3.6, it's 11.3.6. And 
And so that's where we would go to get information related to the load slip modulus for the fasteners, which happens to be gamma, and it's 180,000 times D to the 1.5 factor. And it's based on the D of the nail, and from the basic these are in our, um, it's either, it's also in the NDIS and the wind and seismic provision for a 16 penny nail, we have 0.162. Plug that into the equation and we get 11,737. So we have 11,737 in the denominator. We have 12 nails at that cord splice. And then we have our tension and compression. That's two times that. And the two is because we have two sets of nails on either side of that splice. So that's why there's a two there. And that equals 0 0.054 uh, for our displacement at one cord splice. And then from there, we plug that delta C into the equation. We have a cord splice at 16 feet and another one at 16 feet. So it's just two times that. Divide by two and, and then divide by 24. That's 0 0.036 inches. Okay, so that was for tension. And um, one thing, let me go back to that really quick about the tension. Okay, that I kind of, yeah, okay. So we have compression, and the compression cord slip, we're assuming that it's similar to the tension cord slip, and um, so we use the same 0.36. So the total cord slip is going to be 0 0.036 total for that. And um, so we, when we're looking at it for compression, we're assuming the butt joints in the compression cord are, are not tight together and have a gap that exceeds that actual cord, uh, the splice slip. So we're equating, we're using the value that we would have from the tension cord slip and just multiplying it by two to get 0 0.072. So looking back now in what we determined and plugging them into the overall equation, we see that the bending cord deformation excluding slip, slip is 0 0.078 inches. Then the bending cord slip, splice slip, where the splices are is 0 0.072. And then when we look at the shear deformation that includes the panel shear and nail slip, it's 036. So when you add that to the uh, contribution from the bending of the actual diaphragm, you can add those two 0 0.078 and 0 0.072 together. It comes out to be 0.15. So the bending of the whole three-part equation is less than, well, about half of what it is from the contribution to the shear. And so thinking about that, if you're, run, you're doing the analysis and you're not really uh, making, meeting the requirements of drift, one way to have less drift and have an impact on the overall equation is where we're talking this middle term. Because that has, in this example, twice as much contribution to the deflection than the bending of of the cords and the slip at the cords. So something to consider. You can tighten up the nailing or, or uh, change your panel thickness to bump this, I mean, to reduce the contribution for that deformation of the shear if you're looking to do that. So here, Lori, do you wanna come back in and do a poll? Sure thing, yeah. All right. Which of the following contributed the most to the deflection of the diaphragm? Is it bending and cord deformation, shear panel slip, or sorry, shear panel, shear and nail slip, cord sp slice slip, or all of the above? 
And this is which of the following contributes to the, mo the most. All right, and we've got about two thirds of you have voted and this past 30 seconds. So we'll go ahead and close it and share the results. And it looks like about two thirds of folks thought it was sheer panel slip and nail slip. So let's let Michelle see if two thirds of the crowd was right. Okay, two thirds. So that is the sheer panel shear and nail slip. And um, I guess it may be a little tricky question, but the highlight, it, uh, the thing to is this most, what contributed most to the deflection of the diaphragm? And let's review that. Back into the three-part equation, we have bending cord deformation excluding SIP, so here. Then we have the shear panel, shear and nail slip, which is 0 0.306. And then we have bending cord slit, splice slip. That's hard to say. <laughs> okay, so bending cord splice slip. And as you can see, um, this is 0 0.306, whereas each of these are less than 0.306. 306. So what contributed most to the overall deflection, and maybe we should have put the overall deflection in that, but in the question, but to the deflection of the diaphragm, the shear, panel shear, and nail, nail slip contributed most. Okay, it looks like we have some time to go through the FAQs and look at that a little bit. And then we might shorten that a little bit to also cover some of the questions that have come in. So one of the FAQs that we have uh, received or, or frequently asked question is, okay, we have diaphragms and we need to, why do we need to determine deflection if we're not in seismic areas or what's the big deal? Because we know that in the code, it states that we need to determine what the drift is, if we meet the allowable drifts for that are uh, in the code. Where else does it say we need to look at deflection and how does this all come in play? Well, I mentioned one thing and it has to do with determining the flexor and or whether or not you have a rigid diaphragm. And I'll get into that in a little bit, but there are other areas to consider when looking at deflection. One of them being is the deflection limits uh, that are shown in the code are related to the sheathing material of the walls. So if we have a wall, uh, there are requirements in chapter 16 that have uh, deflection requirement, minimum deflection requirements for where the finishes are plaster or stucco finish, brittle finish, and flexible finish. And that's all in the table 1604.3. Now, uh, and then in table in chapter 24 that includes glass, there is also some information related to minimum deflection requirements for glass. And even on top of this, there may be some requirements if an architect is specifying some type of material that has more stringent requirements in that out of plane loading of that wall because maybe they have some stone or some special type of finish that requires less movement than what is minimally specified in the code. Okay, and then I also mentioned about transferring the load to the shear walls and how do we know how to transfer that load? Do we transfer it assuming a flexible diaphragm or do we transfer it using a rigid diaphragm approach? And how do we know if we have a rigid diaphragm or a flexible diaphragm? Well, ASCE 7 has some information related to flexible and rigid diaphragms. And um, 
that is coming in the next few slides. Let me skip forward to that. I'll, I'll mention that in a second. So there are deflection requirements. Uh, there are two ways of determining if you have a flexible diaphragm. One is if you have, you can calculate if you have a flexible diaphragm looking at this equation. If your deflection of your diaphragm is greater than two times your shear wall drift, then you can idealize your diaphragm as flexible. So if it is flexible, that means that the load that's in the diaphragm will be transferred like it was a simple beam and you take a tributary area, half of that load goes to one shear wall, half of that load goes to the other. In a, and I should have fast done that. And that's in 12.3.1.3 of ASCE 7. And then there's a prescriptive approach on determining if one has a flexible diaphragm, which is shown here. And that is if diaphragms are constructed of untop steel decking or wood structural panels, then it can be idealized as flexible if any of the following conditions exist. So for wood, wood construction, this would not apply, A. Um, or I'm sorry, it would if you have a vertical elements of steel brace, um, et cetera. Okay, these are shear walls and that, so that would not apply. But then the one and two family dwellings that could apply to wood structural, uh, wood structural diaphragms. And then, so B and C, and then in structures that are a light frame construction where all of the following conditions are met. And so light frame could be wood or it could be uh, the metal studs or light gauge framing cold form steel now. And then, so the topping of concrete or similar materials is not placed over wood structural panel, except if you have non-structural topping, no greater than one and a half inches thick. That's one. And then it also needs to meet each line of the vertical elements of the seismic force resisting system complies to the story drift. Then you can I idealize it as a flexible diaphragm. So if you don't meet any of these requirements, the other path to determining a flexible diaphragm is in the previous slide where you've got to determine the deflection of diaphragm, then compare it to the drift of the uh, average drift of the shear walls and um, determine if it's two times. Otherwise, it could be semi-rigid um, or it could be rigid. So for the rigid though, a prescriptive path would can not meet this requirement because this requirement is all about concrete slabs or concrete over metal deck and wood can't meet this requirement because obviously it's not concrete or concrete or med over metal deck. So this is all in ASCE 710 and then ASCE 716. And here's just a graphic of showing you when it is calculated when you're doing the calculation. Here's the maximum diaphragm deflection here, MDD, which is shown here. The average drift of the vertical elements, ADVE. And so the diaphragm is flexible if the maximum diaphragm deflection is greater than that two times the average vertical element. And then in ASCE 716, it, the equation looks a little different, but it's pretty much the same because what it does is it just has a ratio of that maximum deflection, diaphragm deflection over the deflection of the average vertical element and it's greater than two. So they just took this and brought it over to the other side of the equation in ASC 716. Okay, and then the, the diaphragm looks a little slightly different, but the it's still what we're looking at is the deflection of this diaphragm and comparing it to the average story drift of the shear walls. Okay, so the other aspect is it, in the prescriptive requirements, it talks about that uh, having light frame construction, having 
the concrete topping no greater than 1.5 inches, but also meeting the requirements of each line of the vertical elements uh, need to meet the requirements of the allowable storage rib. So the, here it says the deflection in plane of the diaphragm sh shall not, as determined by engineering analysis, shall not exceed the permissible deflection of each of the attached elements. And the permissible deflection shall be that deflection that will permit the attached elements to maintain its structural integrity under individual loading and continue to support the, subscribe, the prescribed loads. So that's another area that the deflection of the diaphragm needs to meet this criteria. This is also noted in the wind and seismic provision. I kind of skipped over it a little briefly. Here, I'll go back to this. When here, where we talk about deformation, and this is in chapter four about deformation requirements, deformations of connections within and between structural elements shall be considered in the design of such that the deformation of each element and connection comprising the lateral system is compatible with the de deformation of other lateral force resisting systems and connections. So all this deformation needs to be considered in the overall system. And then also um, similar to what is in ASC 7 is the whole deformation. You need to consider it permissible deflection shall be that deflection that will permit the diaphragm and any attached elements to maintain their structural integrity and continue to support their prescribed loads as determined by the applicable building code and standards. Okay, so let me jump forward to the next one. I'm gonna go ahead and go into this uh, frequently asked question. Are there provisions to calculate the deflection for a diaphragm that is only partially blocked at the ends only, or is it proper to base the deflection on the entire diaphragm being unblocked? And so the answer is, there are no provisions for partially blocked diaphragms, but you could look at it as both a blocked diaphragm and an unblocked diaphragm and determine the magnitude in the difference and use engineering judgment somewhere in between there to determine what the deflection is. Another question that we get is, um, I mentioned this when we were looking at chapter 23 where it references the wind and seismic provision for determining deflection. And then also there was a four term equation in the IBC that the third term had a 0.188 E sub N. And so this has to do with that. And it says, when the nailing pattern in a horizontal diaphragm varies, instead of being uniform, how is deflection calculated? And the using the four term equation, it assumes that the fasteners or the nails are all uniform across the diaphragm. But we there are some cases where you want to reduce the amount of nails in the interior portion of the diaphragm where there's less demand on their diaphragm. And so you could have concentrate uh, closer space nails at the perimeter, the near the shear walls, and then in the middle of the diaphragm, you could have less uh, farther apart nails. So there is a section in the this document, which is diaphragms and shear walls, and it's a publication by APA. You can go to their website and download it for free. It's uh, APA wood.org. You just have to create a username and password, but the publication is free. And there's an appendix C that provides an example of how to adjust the equation, the deflection equation, to take into consideration non-uniform nailing. So that answers 
that equation. And then, uh, which is shown here, um, apawood.org. The document uh, is known as L350 is, uh, if you want to go, but if you just Google the name on their website, it'll come up and you can download it for free. So Lori, since we have 10 more minutes, do you want to field some questions that came in? Maybe you've already answered it and you want to share it with the audience or? Um, well, we've had a lot of great questions come in, so I just want to thank everybody for that. Um, one that came in that uh, I thought was a, a good one. Um, when we talk about diaphragm aspect ratios in SpidWiz table 4.2.4, when we're talking about measuring the length and the width, how do we measure the length and the width? Is it the total building dimensions or is it the distances between your shear wall lines? Um, and I don't know if you want to handle that one or oh. if you want me to since I kind of already commented on it a little bit. You can comment on it, but it, it depends on how you're modeling your diaphragm. If you're modeling right. your diaphragm, say you have an interior shear wall and and so then you break up your diaphragm between the two shear walls, then the aspect ratio is going to be based on that exterior shear wall, the interior shear wall, and analyzing it that way. Is that, I don't know if you had how you. Yes, yes, that was, that was the point I was making as well. So if you, if you have interior shear walls, then it would be, you know, those distances between those shear walls. If you did not have interior shear walls, obviously, then it would just be the entire building. So right. that was a good question. All right. Um, another question that folks were asking related to cantilever diaphragms, which are addressed in SPIDWIS section 4.2.5.2. And there was some questions related to how would you calculate deflections on those types of, of elements? So in the SPIDWIS commentary in uh, example C4.2.5.2, uh, that example illustrates the components of deflection that contribute to a seismic story drift at the edges for a simple cantilever design structure. So oh, yeah, 4252 is before right we did yeah it's a, and it's a good question so um yeah it's uh page 72 in the the hard copy that um let's see if that'll work it's, yeah 4252 is is that what yep, you're there about? it is right. yep that's exactly it so you can see in there there's a discussion in the commentary that talks about addressing drift for these structures and because they are torsionally irregular obviously there's a some eccentricity between the center center of mass and center of rigidity as you noted in the illustration so some people were asking about it um, we didn't have obviously a lot of time to spend on it today but there is information in the special design provisions for wind and seismic yep. and a similar question uh, along those lines came in on analyzing irregularly shaped structures and for that um, you know that SPIDWIS doesn't really discuss it explicitly uh, and you could actually write a textbook about it which some some folks did <laughs> so there's a, a textbook that you can get it through ICC's website it's also on Amazon it's called the analysis of irregular shaped structures and it's written by Terry Malone and Robert Rice so for those of you that are doing a lot of irregularly shaped structures, this is a great resource. I definitely, I have a copy on my bookshelf. Um, so, that, you know, like I said, it's a literal textbook on the topic. So we could, couldn't hope to uh, get into all of it in a one and a half hour session. That's the one you were talking about, right? Yep, that's the one. It, it's in the uh, handout also. Okay, right. we had, um, and, and on that same topic, when we've been looking at deflections this whole time. So what this states is, and this is in chapter four of the wind and seismic provisions, it says calculations of diaphragm deflection shall account for 
bending and shear deflection, fastener deformation, cord splice slip, and other contribution sources of deflection. And you're permitted to use this equation to determine the deflection. Now, what it also states is, so this is, you can use this, but you don't always have to use this. What it states is, alternatively, for wood structural panel diaphragms, deflection shall be permitted to be calculated using rational analysis, where apparent shear stiffness accounts for panel shear deformation and nonlinear nail slip in the sheathing to framing connections. Great. So another yeah. path to justify, as long as you provide a rational analysis. Mm -hmm. And then for those, so that, was, that was, a, <laughs> what? That was a tough one. I was going to say if, if uh, I thought, sorry, I thought you were um, done on that one. Keep going, please. Oh, I was just going to say for those in the audience, uh, awc.org if you want a to download a copy of it you go to awc.org go to codes and standards and then go to nds more information and then it's shown here we have the other earlier versions as well but it this free version here and it only it does not include the commentary if you'd like the commentary you have to purchase it and this is all these question marks with the green white question mark is what's changed so what that does is provide a structure magazine article on oh i forgot i was an author on this <laughs> anyway <laughs> uh, too much going on i guess is it gets a gives you an overview of the changes from the 2008 to the 2015. Mm -hmm. great all right um here is another question it came in you can answer uh, <laughs> i actually can't answer this one but uh i'll i'll see if you want to it's not a t it's not nearly as tough as the other ones i've been giving you what's the difference between a blocked and an unblocked diaphragm uh do you want to answer that because that we can, yeah, I can take if we have a picture can, yeah. um yeah you want to try to find a picture so the the difference is is related to the support of your wood structural panel edges yeah so when we have a blocked diaphragm it is assumed that all of the edges of a wood structural panel are supported and it's either supported by the framing yep. or in, it's supported by interior blocking that would be you know bridging between that framing oh. um supporting the edge of the panel so unblocked here. diaphragms don't yeah there you go so unblocked diaphragms don't have that blocking Right, so you have nailing where the framing is going, and then um, at the unsupported edges, there would not be any blocking. That's what you, I think, we're talking about. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's. So let me see. There's another thing, which maybe it shows it in here. Well, go ahead, and I'll see if I can find another picture too. Okay. Um, can, can we use the G sub A value for wind design? Okay, hang on. I'm... You can. And the one reason why, here, this is perfect timing because we have the table right here. It's almost like we planned this, but we really didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have this seismic session and then we have the wind section. And what we see is that we have the G sub A under the seismic, but and that is because the requirements that are mostly needed to determine the deflection for the diaphragm is for seismic reasons, but they can certainly be used for wind design. And they are already multiplied times 1.5 because they, they consider the 1.4 because they are at strength design. But the difference between wind capacity and seismic capacity is 1.4. If you go across the table, you would see the wind capacities are 1.4 times that. So they can certainly be used when doing wind design. But it, here's it. Let me blow this up. Did that... Uh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> no, that... That was a perfect answer, exactly what I would have said. 
so here we go. This little picture here, and I think this is in, in the other high low diaphragms, shows you where there's blocking along the panel edges here where there may not be a framing member. So the framing is going up and down the sheet and the panels are spanning across 90 degrees to that. And at this edge, you wouldn't have a framing member. And so the blocking supports that panel edge. And that's a block diaphragm. And one thing I, I like to point out on those diagrams, Michelle, is um, really the the thing that that they're emphasizing that they recently updated is that we're emphasizing the direction of the continuous panel joints. Right. And not not necessarily the framing or the orientation of the the wood structural panels, but the that actual continuous panel joint that is it, it called out in that illustration there. Right. So like what Lori is talking about is this panel joint here is continuous. This direction, you don't have a continuous panel joint. But in this direction and how the load is applied to it, and here we have this direction, that's what you're right. Okay. A few more. We need to, I think, how about yeah, another one? About, yeah, we'll just take one more. Uh, and let's see. It, if you are using okay what options are there for designing thicker diaphragms so spidways only lists capacities up to a structural one grade material up to 15 30 seconds inch thickness so if we are using something other than that okay so this table that we see here actually is for minimum nominal panel thicknesses. So certainly you can use this table for thicker panel thicknesses. And then we also, oops, well, went through that fast. We have high low diaphragms. So here, what's the maximum thickness? 1932nd here. Um, if you want to take into account a thicker wood structural panel, there are capacities in the high low diaphragm for 23, 32nd, um, but remember, I'm uh, not remember, when the, these tables are developed, what they look at is, what is, well, one of the things they look at is the failure mechanism when we're dealing with diaphragms and when we want a ductile diaphragm. And so there are things that contribute to do that ductile diaphragm is the fasteners. And we have all these nails that are connecting the wood structural panel to the framing. So the least common denominator in a lot of this is that fastener. We want it to fail the fastener rather than, which will provide a ductile failure rather than a more brittle failure, which could be the wood structural panel. So we want to keep it in that nail being the uh, least common denominator of all of these. Oh, and hopefully that made sense. Mm -hmm. All right, Let, let's just do one last quick one. So this one you actually addressed. I know, I'm sorry. I'll let you answer it. <laughs> it's like my old karate teacher. Just one more. Uh, <laughs> what is the difference between flexible and rigid diaphragms? So this is one you did address, but I think it's worth pointing out again. Um, and I think you had some slides that illustrated it as well, that the actual yeah. definition of flexible and rigid diaphragm isn't coming from SPIDWIS per se, it's coming from ASC 7. Oh, yes. So, and what's the big deal too? Why do you have to do flexible versus rigid? Um, the difference is, and then they're semi-rigid as well. And the wind and seismic provision goes into that. Let me, sorry, I'm losing this. Oop. But I went from the wrong one. Let me go to that slide. So one is you have the two ways of determining if you have a flexible diaphragm. One is the calculated approach, determining your deflection of your diaphragm, making sure it's two times the average story drift of your or uh, of the vertical lateral resisting system, or the prescriptive approach, which is shown here. And one. If you have a flexible diaphragm, you transfer the load from your diaphragm based on tributary. You can 
analyze it as if it is a a beam and then half of the load goes to one shear wall, half the load goes to another shear wall. If you don't meet either of these criteria and you want to categorize it or idealize it as a rigid diaphragm, you need, still need to do some calculations and determine if it is less than two times the story drift and or meet these prescriptive requirements, but you can't because we're wood structural panel diaphragm. But if you have a rigid diaphragm, it's not distributing the load based on tributary area. It's based on the rigidity of your vertical lateral resisting system. Now, the, the one thing about that open front structure or the cantilever diaphragm, when analyzing that, you have to treat the diaphragm as a rigid diaphragm because it, it, how else is it going to transfer the load to the adjacent walls unless it's a rigid diaphragm? It wouldn't be able to do it if it's a flexible diaphragm. Okay, do you have anything to add to that, Lori? Right. That's it, so let me close this out. I just have a few more slides, so let me... We have a code official connections program. If you are a code official or a fire official uh, to check out our free program for individuals employed by governmental jurisdictions. And I'll just leave this up as we're exiting. Thank you again, everyone, for your attendance, for your questions. And we hope to see you uh, in two weeks for our deck panel discussion or perhaps next month when we do our CLT connection examples. Someone asked what style of karate you do. <laughs> I, I did uh, Shotokan karate for about three years. Pretty cool. All right. All right. We'll go ahead and close this out. Thanks a lot, Michelle. And thank you again, everybody.